from Bethany Community Christian Church of Sedalia, North Carolina comes Fill My Cup Ministry at FillMyCupSpace.com Featuring Bethany's Senior Pastor, the Honorable Dr. Henry L. Simmons. I want to read a scripture here as a backdrop for our, for our sermon, but this is not the sermon text. I will get to that in a minute. But I wanted to share with you something stated in one of the epistles to the Colossians, speaking about who Jesus is. Colossians 1, and we're going to start at the 12th verse. Colossians 1, 12. He said, Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sin. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. We're talking about Jesus. Did he leave anything out? And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Is that heavy enough for you? Do I need to go get a little more weight? And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now like this. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Y'all know we talking about Jesus? And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Amen. Amen. I don't think we should read anymore. I just wanted y'all to know before I start talking about Jesus, who is he? Did you get the impression that everything that was made in heaven and in earth was made by him and for him? Y'all get this? Okay, now we're going to ask our God sermon text. These are ways of saying it. God commissioned these writers to tell the story of his son that he sent in earthly, an uh, earthly vessel. God sent, had these writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four gospel writers. They were to tell the story. That's why I know that when we look at uh, Islam, that Mohammed went out in the desert by himself and came back with the Quran. You know, God don't operate like that. God said, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So one person can get anything strong, but God said, let somebody else do it. God wrote the Bible over 3,000 years with seven, I forgot the number of people that read the Bible. Some were contemporaries of others and some were thousands over a hundred years from the other. They told the same story. They followed the golden thread that led to the birth of Christ. And these four writers were chosen. And the first one, Matthew, how did he begin his book? He began his book to say that, uh, that the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said, You would have a child, and they should call his name Jesus. For he shall separate his people from their sins. And I like the way that Matthew said, When the time had fully come, God sent forth his son. When the time was right. When the Kronos was right. God sent his son. God. And when you go over to the next book, Matthew, Mark, Mark said, well, let me tell my story when Jesus got his commission. 
And Mark started to tell that he was sitting on the banks of the Jordan River when John the Baptist would come out of the desert early in the morning with his beard down to his waist, to his knees. He was a Nazarene from his birth. He was the child of Elizabeth. And he would come out and he would tell him people to make the way for the Lord. God is coming. Get it straight. I like the way the old Baptist preachers would say. They said the, the, the ground before the cross is level ground. No high, no big eyes and, and little U's. Everything is level before the cross. And John the Baptist would preach and he said he would bring the mountains down. And he would lift up the valleys. Everything will be stretched out before God. Right he said, come, bring you meat worthy of repentance. I like the part when he saw the Pharisees, you know the church folks? They was coming down, they wanted to know what was going on down there. And John was baptized, and then John looked up and saw him, he said, you generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee the wrath that cometh? Who has warned you? Getting yourself together. He said, behold, the axe is at the foot of the tree. And in any tree that don't bear forth good fruit, God going to cut it down and throw it in the fire. So he's going to burn it with unquenchable fire. They asked John, said, well, who are you? Are you Messiah? John said, no, I'm not Messiah. Said, then who are you? He said, I'm just a voice of one crying in the wilderness. He went all the way back to Isaiah and pulled that scripture out and said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make ye the way of the Lord. Make his way straight. God was getting ready to do something heavy. That's how John opened up the book. Matthew, Mark. I mean, Mark opened it up. Matthew, Mark. Luke is the next writer. How did Luke start? Luke was not a disciple of Jesus. Luke was a, a, a physician. He was an investigative reporter. He started to do questioning people, trying to find out. And this was the results of his work. He said, oh, Theopolis, I have wrote it down for you. These are the things that we surely have seen among us. And Luke started his off by saying, when Ananias, when the man was in the temple, God appeared to him in the temple, told him, say, your wife shall bear a son, and you shall call his name John. He shall be great. He shall come in the spirit of Elijah. And that boy couldn't believe it, and God took his voice from him. He couldn't even tell it. And he went home and told his wife Elizabeth, he wrote it for her. She went to laughing because all her life she had prayed to have a child. And here she was, past menopause. And you're going to tell me I'm going to get pregnant? <laughs> I know why uh, Abraham's wife laughed. She named her baby Isaac, mean laughter, because she couldn't believe that she could carry this child. And that's how Luke opens his story. He showed the God that the angel Gabriel was in the temple and told him that what he was going to have. So God sent forth the, the leader who was going to open the door, and then he sent forth. And six months later, that same angel came to Mary and told Mary she should bring forth a child. That's how Luke opens it up. Now our last writer, John. How did John tell his story? John was the only one that died a natural death. John lived to the turn of the first century. John, even in his old age, he was pastoring down in Ephesus. When the Roman authorities wanted to get rid of him, they said, he's the last one. And they said, well, let, let's, let's want to make a martyr out of him. Let's, let's, let's get rid of him quietly. And they boiled a, a, a kettle of water, oil and dumped him in that oil. Now, this is not in your Bible. If you read uh, uh, Fox Book of the Martyrs, they say when they open that, when they flip that drum over, John slid out, still alive. And the Romans said, we, we can't kill him because we'll just make another martyr. And they put him on the Isle of Patmos, a penal colony in the middle of the Aegean Sea, between Europe and, 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 and Asia Minor. That's what he had, John. Now, how did John start his book? Keep in mind that John wrote the last book. He didn't know that when he was on the Isle of Patmos that God was, was waiting for him on that island. 
One day John said he lay, said he thought he said it was on the Lord's day, the first day of the week. The Holy Spirit grabbed him on the Lord's day. I like that part. We said, I saw a door open in heaven and a voice like a trumpet said, Come up here. Boom, just like that. John was in heaven. See, he said, was around the throne room. He saw the, the ember rainbow over the glassy sea. Oh, I could preach on just telling you what John saw, but that ain't what we're about this morning. But John saw something. Hey! John said he saw, heard voices from the, from the throne and peals of lightning. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. So how did John start his book? This is how John started his book. Chapter John 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. This sound familiar? This sound like we were reading in Colossians? And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness com comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which bringeth, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name, which was born not of blood, and not of the will of, man, of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. May God add a blessing to his red word. Now you notice something. When you read the word in the right context, you can sense the word. The word burn, burn holes into you when you sense what God is talking about and who he's talking about. John said, I'm going to tell you the story about Jesus, but I want you to know you got to go a little further back than this. You got to go to the beginning, in the beginning, when there was nothing, no heaven, no earth. There was nothing, that there was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So the word, God reached into his bosom and he took out the word and wrapped it in flesh and he became and we beheld his glory. The only begotten of the Father. Now who is Jesus? The word of God. The word became flesh. Amen. So Jesus wasn't somebody. I heard a preacher on the other day talking about and God created Jesus. Jesus was the word. There was never a time there was a father without the word. And never was a time there was a word without the father. They were there, inseparable almost. I like the way the old Baptist preacher said, said when Jesus was trying to figure out, when God was trying to figure out what to do, said the word said, send me, send me God, send, send me Father, send me. If you give me a body, I'll go. It sounds so mythological, you know. But those old preachers knew what they were doing when they was mythologizing the word. They made it real. You could sense it. Let the word of God was saying, I, I know you need somebody who haven't sinned, but if you make me a body, I'll live on that planet for 33 years without sin. You can take my life. God. That's what God, y'all hear this thing? Amen. See what it was, we were in a problem situation. And some of us today are in a problem situation. What do you mean problem situation? Uh, you don't have enough money for the ends. Don't have enough money for the month. Don't have enough wellness in your body to make it another day. Whatever the problem may be, God said it. You had a situation. 
that needed dealing with. And the first situation was sin. Oh, don't we think we something? We don't have sin to deal with no more, do we? You know, sin is something old that's coming. That's what they used to preach about is sin. You know, now we're in postmodern. We're in modernity now. We don't talk about sin. What do you mean sin? It used to be you could name them all. Gambling, drinking, cheating on your wife or your husband or whatever. Oh, you could name off those sins. But we're so cool now. We're so clean. We don't do none of those things. When we get ready to cheat on our wife, we go to the Biltmore. We go to the, we go to the, uh, the Waldorf. You don't cheat up in there. You just having a good time. I went to the club one night. The man said, he said, he said, is that your wife or did you come to have a good time? We don't sin. Because we, we've outgrown that. We're in modernity. You know, we, we mean sin. Guy asked me, he said, said, Reverend, what is sin? You know, we, have, we are living in a country, in America, where we really don't want to understand the concept of sin. Now, let me see if I can explain that. Now, they told me, last time I explained it, my wife told me, she said, you know, don't nobody want to hear that. <laughs> it's hard to explain, but let me see if I can explain this. See, our universe is also a moral universe. And God made everything to work together. And God has a plan for everything. And anything that jumps out of God's plan is sin. Y'all follow me? Am I, am I, well, let, let me see if I, let me, first of all, let me get a little sweat off me. I'll be all right. See, it's a matter of will. What did God give the human being? So he breathed into his nostrils and he became a living soul, a living psyche, a will. Intellect and choice. The mere fact that he gave him will, that means to have volition that he could do what he wanted to do within the constraints that God has made him. You can't live without a head, so that's out of the constraints that God placed for you. But inside of those constraints, God will that you shall be holy. God will that you should love your neighbor and love your enemy. God will that you should love him. But God gave us the volition that we can love who we want to love. Song came out once said, if you can't love with the, I can't remember it, but it was something about just love anybody. <laughs> the point I, I, I'm making is that man moved away from God's will. And let's see how he first started. There were two people on the planet. There was no sin. Because there was no restriction. Then one day God stepped out. And says I got a restriction for you guys. You can eat from any tree. You can sleep on any tree. You can do whatever you want to. But there is one tree in the midst of the garden. You should not eat from. God pronounced a will, his will, that you should not eat from that tree. And the serpent told her, did God tell y'all y'all couldn't eat from that tree? Did God also tell y'all that if you ate from that tree, you would know the knowledge of good and evil? You would be just like God? Who? Just like God? We mean, we'd be in charge, right? Yes, I like that. I think I tried took a little bite, nothing happened. Hey, call my husband. Come on over here, Daddy. Let's try this fruit. Now, this was the time Daddy was supposed to say no, because God had told him no. But he tried it anyway. And as a result, let me see if I can put it in another format. Assume that the tree was a portal, was a means of going to another location. A door, if you will. And there was another door in the garden called the tree of life. A portal, if you will. A door. And God has set both doors in the garden. The garden was pure. There was no sin nowhere. It was an age of purity. But God, or should I say, an age of innocence. 
That's what it was. An age of innocence. And God said, I got two choices here. If you go through this door, you will go into the sacred world where God is. If you go through this portal, you will go to the profane world where Satan and his boys are. That's the choice that we had. We weren't told to eat from that tree of life, but we were told do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So once we opened that door, we opened the door to the profane world and it rushed in on us and everything in innocence changed immediately, instantaneously. The animals were all eating herbs and some grew long teeth and had a desire for meat. Some grew poison so they could strike their victim and catch him later on. The herbivores were all that was on the planet. And now they, you had animals that ate each other. You had animals that flew through the sky, now had long beaks that they could reach into the flesh and pull out what they wanted. The world changed instantly. It was a profane world, like the one the guy said, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. That's what it was. Profane. And in that world, God did not want man to be out. Man had sinned. He was trying to hide himself. And God made him a little coat, a little skirt. Well, it kind of went around and about, covered him up pretty good. Amen. And God put him out of the garden. Do you know what God said when he put him out of the garden? We ain't going to be long with you. This is what God said. He sent an angel with a flaming sword. So I want you to stand there. Don't let him come back in. Because if they get to the tree of life in their condition, they will enter into life eternal in a state of sin. See, he didn't want to make that in a state of the rest of their life in a state of sin. He told the angel to protect it, don't let them come back. So now we were out there with our little coats, hiding our sin, scared of each other. Somebody don't know what we're talking about because we're in modern America. You ain't got to be off in the woods somewhere to understand fear. You can be afraid to go out your house at night in the middle of the city. Now, that's the condition that we were in. And God says, I got to save my people. But the word had already went out. The soul that said it shall die. You know, some people believe that they didn't die when they ate from the fruit. Yes, they did. They died, they died immediately. They died instantaneously. Not when the woman ate, but when the man ate, they died. What death were we talking about? They died a spiritual death. Before Adam ate from that tree, he was spiritually alive, and God would come down to the, to the garden in the heat, cool of the day, and, and commune with Adam. He was alive. He could talk to God. He knew all about it. But when he got cut off, God said, Adam, where are you? I'm hiding over here. He said, what's wrong? He said, I was naked. He said, well, who told you you were naked? And that's where we are. We are all naked, running for cover. And God wants to put us in his family. How can he reach out and grab us? He's got to find some way to bring us to him. And his, 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 he, he, he came to the point where he realized that somebody has to pay the price for their sins. If I can get somebody to pay the price, I can forgive them of their sins and forgive them of all their unrighteousness. And then they will be available to come into my family and live with me. Isn't that something? The sad thing about it, when God forgave us of our sins, we still are inhabiting the old human. You know, the Bible says all things are created new. Oh, my God, all things are new. What he means is the old spirit that was in you, God has replaced that with his spirit. But the old man is still there. Still have fear. Still has fear. And even in our churches, we got people in our churches that are afraid. 
Because we have not allowed God to come in and penetrate every area of our life. I got a member that keeps saying, stand on the word. What he's really saying is, if you just allow God to come in and take full control, you can walk with your head up high. You can be like the song said. He said, love among these three is like love, hope and love, and love never ends. It has ceased no evil, smells no evil. He doesn't recognize it. it it's just like the little baby, daddy, daddy, daddy. That's what it's like. And God wants us all to be his children. And it breaks his heart. Why? Because he has given a little bit of himself. He said, he said, I will put my spirit in you. Boom. And then he says, it will stay with you. Until the day of redemption. All of us, we are God's children and the spirit of God dwells in us and it's going to be here till God take us out of this body. So all the mess you're doing, the lies you're saying, cutting people down, doing all the backstabbing and all of that, you're doing it with the Holy Spirit in you. God is grieved when his children are fighting each other. When his children are throwing rocks at each other. God is grieved. The Holy Spirit in you is grieved. He said, grieve not the Holy Spirit by which you are sealed to the day of redemption. Quench not the Spirit. Sometimes the Holy Spirit wants you to do something and you are afraid to do it. Let that uh, Spirit of God overcome the fear. He says, I have not given you the spirit of fear. I have given you the power and the strength of a sound mind. That's what God gave us. When somebody asks you to pray, pray or somebody asks you to read a scripture, stand boldly for God has not given us the Spirit. God has not given that to us. And don't get upset because somebody doing good and they didn't give you a chance. Just keep on living and trusting in God. God will open the door for you. He said, do all things as unto the Lord. Your Father in heaven, he sees and he will reward. He will reward. Not you, not pastor going to reward me. If you can your reward for me, that's all you're going to get. You better get it from the Lord. God know where you are. I don't know where you are. I might think Sister Titan is a good old girl. Somebody else might know different. God knows. And what he said. He Thank said, you for watching Fill My Cup Ministry with the Honorable Dr. Henry L. Simmons. If this broadcast has been a blessing to you, please let us know. Dr. Simmons would be thrilled to hear from you. You may write us at Fill My Cup Ministry. P.O. Box 178, Sedalia, North Carolina, 27342. Or you may call our toll-free number at 844-512-2671. You can also follow Dr. Simmons on Twitter, Vimeo, and of course on our website where you can feel free to donate to this ministry. Thank you for watching, and we will see you next week. And please, don't forget to invite a friend.